Let me start with this. Is this you? How many how many people here have ever had to manage a Linux system? I guess even if the answer is most of you. Uh, at this point, at this particular time. So uh, let me ask: Has anyone in this room had to manage uh, manage storage on a logging system? Yes. Show of hands. Okay. Now let me ask you a question. Um, give me an example of something you had to do. Your work. Uh, uh, expand the VG. Expand the VG. Okay. In in high level terms, can you describe how you would do that? Sure. So. Find another VG that isn't using all the storage, do some much storage of that VG, and then go to the new VG, get its ID, expand it, and then save it again. Okay, a, a, a little lower than that, what would, be, what would be the tools in your tool bag for doing that? LPM. Well, uh, I mean, I guess if I had to do it on a single system, I would just use LPM one more time. Okay. Uh, Command, uh, command line tool, you expand, you yeah. create, yeah, 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 yeah. you can reduce. It's, it's where I was, where I was okay. trying to be yeah. there. Sure. So, um, <laughs> so, sorry for being vague. I just, uh, often works best when I can get my audience to, uh, to, uh, to read my slides before I show them. So, yeah, so that's, when, when you're managing storage in Linux, you're, you're pretty much always working from a series of very specific task uh, command line operations. Card ends for uh, position editing. You can you need to extend, you need to reduce, um, make a mess, and so on and so forth. So uh, let me let me change tax for a second and ask: uh, Has anyone here had to uh, modify networking on a uh, Linux system? Yeah. Would you mind giving me an example? Uh, I don't know. Maybe all sorts of different. <laughs> I don't know, for example, if you have like two, uh, two interfaces and you need to, I don't know, uh, do some sort of either bridging or you need to switch between those okay. interfaces. Now, same question I asked Sam. How would you do that? Well, you want, I mean, you want tools specifically? What is the, the process that you as an administrator would follow to do that, first of all? Well, we'll define like, I don't know, modify maybe IP addresses, routes. So not by any bit lines. Yeah. Usually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically this is the entire the, the entirety of how we manage networking on a on a running Linux servers. We hack on a, a series of config files and then restart services or restart specific interfaces. Now what do you notice about these two examples? They're predictable and manual. First of all, both of them require uh, a direct access to a shell on the machine. And the other thing, they are the, the methods that we use to uh, to interact with these systems are completely and totally unrelated. There is absolutely no overlap. And the, and the list goes on. We've got, uh, we have systemd, we have, uh, we have yum, we have uh, firewall D, we have performance tuning, and all of these things all have completely unique and completely different ways that we can figure that out. And a lot of this is historical. Uh, you know, Linux and the, 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 the open source ecosystem has grown up by the development of a series of individual projects that all, you know, had a, had a goal in mind. They all had something that they wanted to do. And when they were building their tool, they were they built their configuration mechanism to be the proper one to give you all of the configuration and all of the detailed work that you need for this specific tool. And that's great for that project. But the problem is that it's not a it doesn't provide a coherent ecosystem for working with the for working with your system after the fact. It doesn't provide you that. It leaves Linux in a state where it's a collection of independent little bits that just happen to be installed off of the same DVD. And this is this is a problem. And, and the real the real problem here is that you can't learn how to manage a complete Linux system. You learn how to manage 
firewall leads. You learn how to how to manage uh, network scripts. You learn how to manage LVM and VG Create. And once you have learned that, congratulations, you are a master of VG Create. And now you don't know anything at all that, is, that, you, that can help you to learn networking. It's something that's helped you learn uh, system service management. And, and that is pretty much why there are so very few junior units in this. Because by the time that you have learned enough to manage, to be even a junior admin of any of these technologies, you have now learned enough to basically be a senior admin on Linux. Um, and this, and this, is, this, this makes it very difficult, and it's part of why, we, or why so many companies have a very hard time getting a sufficient number of IT admins in for Windows, uh, versus Windows. Because basically, you know, anybody can manage, can manage a Windows system because it's very similar to how they manage their home machines. So a couple of years ago, uh, Red Hat did a, a, a customer tour. Uh, and we asked them without prompting to, to you know, give us their pain point. Let us know what are the things that are bothering you. And almost universally, they came back with this, which we paraphrased here. The difficulty of managing these components is directly impacting our customers' ability to consume more Linux. They just simply don't have the ability to have 5,000 machines to one admin. They have 100 machines to an admin or 50 machines to an admin. Because it's very, very difficult to do. So we took that we took that feedback and we realized that's that's very important. That is important to know that if we want Linux to, to expand into the market and to really make headway in, into the market that's currently dominated by Windows, because we solved the we solved the Unix problem. Unix, for all intents and purposes, is a niche market at this point. We won that battle. How do we win the next one? So here's where OpenLMI comes in. What we're doing is we're going to build, and then we've uh, made a great headway in accomplishing this in Fedora 19, uh, is an API, a common, a, a common set of programming tools and scripting tools that we can use to interact with all of the various subsystems on your computer and, and, and do so in a, in a way that when you learn to manage uh, system services through OpenLMI, you have now covered at least half of the knowledge you needed to, uh, to learn in order to manage uh, some storage. Through that, same, through that same set of interfaces. And we also want to be able to, to use this API uh, as, as a set of tools to build on so that external projects, so things like uh, the utilities of the world, can talk to all these machines through a common interface and be able to leverage in a consistent way all of the power that we, that we offer in all of these different different packages. Uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, and, well, there have been many projects that, uh, that were ambitious and that have tried to do something similar. Um, and we all know how, for example, WebDoc went that's, uh, that succeeded, how well it succeeded, it didn't. Uh, and part of it, and then there was Matahari, and part of it was that all these projects were really trying to invent their own uh, solutions and invent their own technologies to accomplish it. And with OpenLMI, we made, we made a conscious decision right from the beginning that it was going to be built on top of uh, on top of a set of technologies, uh, set of DMTF approved to describe system management. And that we, we're going to take this already written standard and these already written protocols and, and implement them and provide a reference implementation for them uh, in the OpenLMI project. So to break it down a little bit deeper, uh, we built up a number of technologies and we've been working with a number of other technologies in order to uh, make this possible. Um, I, 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 Forgot to mention it earlier in my talk, but one of the other problems that we really have is, especially with uh, individual command line tools and individual script and editing of uh, config files that have no interdependencies, is uh, that you can very easily, uh, with a simple, a simple typo, end up in an inconsistent in your system, oftentimes requiring you to crash cart down to your data center. So we wanted to build OpenLMI entirely on the, a series of platform layer APIs that, that would be internally consistent. I think that, so we, we went and we were trying to figure out uh, one of the first ones, one of the biggest ones we thought was important was the storage. So we took a look at what in Fedora and RHEL we have for storage technology and how to manipulate them. We looked at, at, at the Gparted and we looked at the LVM GUI and we looked at uh, a variety of things. And then we made, a, we made a realization. Anaconda, the installer, 
has the most has the largest subset of capabilities for managing storage on the system because what surprise? If you want to install something, if you want to install software on the system, you need to be able to mount the, the drive. So you need to be able to partition those in those drives. So we went and we talked with the uh, Anaconda developers, and we got they, they agreed to uh, break out the library that they have been maintaining in Anaconda for years into its own separate library that they're calling Glibit. Uh, if you want to know why it's called Glibit, you can ask them. I'm not going to tell that story. Uh, <laughs> what it is, it's a Python API that really that manages storage at all levels of the stack. Everything, everything down to putting up uh, putting a bootloader onto the system, all the way up to uh, mounting a file system. And, and the wonderful thing about it is that it's internally consistent. It has a it has uh, you know if not if not transactions, at least uh, batching of capabilities. And it allows us to uh, to know that once we fire something off at this API, it's going to be, as long as the API kind of does what we want it to do, it's going to end up in a state that's, that is that uh, is usable and consistent. So what, what does this mean? The, the internal consistency of the API, like well, uh, internal consistency is uh, to use the uh, the network manager example. Uh, for uh, for example, it's very easy when you're creating a bridge or bond uh, to you have to edit both the bonding uh, the bonding config file and the uh, the uh, interface config file. If they and if you typo one or the other, your networking is just plain not working. And chances are that was the interface you were using to connect in. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, so the internal consistency is uh, like, okay, if I do this operation, it won't break. Something well, it, if, if this oper if this operation won't break unless that was the unless I was told to break something. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you tell if you tell it my operation is turn off that network interface, you have only yourself to blame. Yeah. Um, but when you're when you're attempting to make a change, it should it should implement the change in whatever way it, in whatever under under the hood uh, capability is necessary. So uh, to, go, to go on and talk a little more about networking, what we've, what we've done is we've, we've been working with the Network Manager project for a while now on uh, make, uh, making that really the default mechanism we use to manage networks in, uh, in Fedora and Relvet and Relvet going forward. Uh, there's a lot of history there. A lot of people are afraid of Network Manager. They, uh, it kind of came on the scene as being essentially that way we got Wi-Fi to work on laptops. But over the last few years, the, uh, the network manager team has done a lot of hard work in uh, adding in these enterprise features, the enterprise VLANs, the bridging support, the bonding support, in fact, bonding and team bonding uh, support. Um, and, the, and these are all features that are now both available in network manager and guaranteed consistent by, the network, by using the network manager API. So that was a perfect match for us. And we, we, we spoke to them and we've been, uh, we've been working collaboratively with the Network Manager project to ensure that the set of functionality that we, uh, that we believe that enterprise users need will be exposed in that API so that OpenNet will not use them and that it can use them as well. Uh, another new technology that came on the scene fairly recently that has been, that has been absolutely and completely uncontroversial was SystemD. Mm. SystemD, uh, it took, it, System D was a great idea that took some time to get up to speed. Um, it was it, it broke a lot of things, including expectations uh, in its early days. And but on the other hand, it has offered us a, a certain level of control over our over the low level of our system services management and our, and our logging management that we really never had. Everything was ad hoc in the uh, in the upstart and SysB init worlds. Um, and with System D now, we have a, a comprehensive API that we can ask it at any moment: What is running on my system? How long has it been running? What, uh, how many children, child processes has it spawned? Uh, how many of them are still alive? And, uh, and we can, and it provides a notification API, so we can we can hook in and know: Hey, this this uh, server that, I, that I've been running, this service, hey, it stopped. Well, I probably want to, I probably want to know that, and it can, and it can be set to be start as well. So this, we've been working also very closely with Leonard and Kai, and uh, and trying to get the trying trying to get these APIs of that from System D in, in in the right shape that we can use them for our own uh, for our needs as well. And I think it's been a very beneficial partnership. I think we've uh, I think going forward, this is going to provide a much better way to actually keep track of what's going on in your system. 
than we ever could before. So I was talking about how we chose to use a series of existing protocols and existing protocol standards to work with. So what we chose was uh, the DMTF SIM model. We have a distributed management task force common information model. And it's, it, it's, it's, the, it's the protocol and the series of technologies around most of the management tools that are out there uh, in, the, in, the, in the world. They, uh, it is being used by various system uh, server vendors and in, as in their interface for their VMCs. And it's being used for you know, VFI interfaces. It's being, it's being used on usually any SAN you can think of. Uh, and so there's a lot of inertia behind it. There's a lot of, uh, you know, we, we re reasoned that Chances are, if all of these corporations and all of these individuals have, have uh, standardized behind this, there's some value there. And moreover, there's a built-in community there. There's an opportunity to work with the Dells and the, uh, and the Cisco's of the world to get these, uh, to get these technologies uh, hammered out. But you said it was going to be simpler. If anyone here has ever used SIM, you know it is not a simple interface. It is an extremely complicated interface. Um, I forgot to bring it, but I, I, usually, I usually come in with a stack of papers. It's about 50 sheets deep, and it is the table of contents for the SIM pro uh, specification. <laughs> um, it, it makes an excellent prop for, that, uh, for, for this talk. And it, it, it is very complicated, and it, is, it can be intimidating uh, to, uh, to program to. So how are we going to solve this? And the uh, CIM is also called... I don't know, all parts of, of the system, or just some specific parts like it, storage, for example? It is, well, the, the entire DMTF setup model models a complete computing system from, uh, for all of its components. And that means, and I, I don't mean uh, simply by hardware, I mean a complete system where it talks about uh, having credential brokers, and it talks about uh, having uh, data about storage and layer unit storage, and it talks about network and feedback configuration, and it talks about all, all of these, all of these various uh, new components that it, it has been I, I, in the works I think for eight to twelve years. I forget which which end of that spectrum they have, but the, uh, you know it's it's backed by a large number of uh, of major computing uh, contributors like the Dells and the Cisco's and the Microsofts. Um, these are these are some of the same technologies that those two companies are using in their management tools. So one of our goals is we're, we're looking at you know, our various competitors in the server space and trying to simplify things. And one of the things that, you know, Microsoft really did well was the ability, it was their PowerShell scripting, their ability to, uh, to write, to have administrators write these powerful shell scripts that, it was, uh, that, 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 that can interact with the SIM models on their, on their Windows systems and do, and do some useful work. And so we wanted to do, we wanted to do something similar to that, but we wanted to do it Better. We didn't want we didn't want all these existing Linux admins to have to go and learn a brand new language because a lot of them already know Python. If, if, if there's a Linux admin in the room that doesn't know Python, uh, they haven't been a Linux admin very long. So rather than, so rather than reinvent the wheel, we, we, we decided to standardize on Python, which was helpful because we already had some uh, some existing tools in the uh, in the ecosystem for uh, communicating over the SIM protocols. And we, we decided that what we're going to do is we're going to build a series of specialized modules, uh, specialized Python modules. We were starting it up a public, there's a public community for doing this that we wanted to engage with it, and the admins to take the SIM models and then just yank out a few pieces, the things that people use the most often. The thing, and, and you know, I don't really care how it happens. I just want my entire disk to be ext3 or ext4 or butterfs. And that's the interface that we want to expose in these in these uh, LMI script modules. Uh, right. Uh, the the goal here is not to, to reproduce the entire interface, but instead to give out just these these small chunks of useful and actual uh, actually understandable information. And we're building we're building these out now. We've got a, I've got a couple of examples that I'm going to show off in the uh, Hackfest I'm doing. Now. I mean, we have to lunch in the same room, uh, dealing with system services and dealing with, uh, with, with well, right now with the, yeah, for the software uh, script script module, we only have, uh, uh, you know, query, but uh, we're going to be doing that, you know, interacting with package kit. 
through installation and so on and so forth. There are two. There are two things that are come out, are going to come out of this, and I, uh, this slide is a little old. Uh, but first, we're going to have these Python modules, which are intended, which are which are being designed so that they can be executed themselves as essentially a, uh, a command line tool, bundled into a a, a, a meta command based uh, environment that we're also building, or they can just be imported into any other Python script that you're working with, or uh, and just just run direct run uh, through their own API, which is which is vastly simplified over the uh, the API model. Uh, so this is this is a piece that we're really focusing on right now. A lot of the a lot of the backend plumbing work at this point is done. It is in Fedora 19 and usable. Um, it's not 100% complete, but uh, as I as I mentioned, uh, 50 pages of table of contents. It's going to be it's going to be years before we have 100% coverage. But for the most part, we're pretty sure we've, we we have hit at least the uh, the 80% case of uh, of these backends. And now we're already doing for one group of compilers. Eventually, but we're not we're not going for it ourselves. We're we're, we're we're working very hard to partner to partner up. We've had a, a lot of excellent conversations with a few different companies. I'm not I'm not entirely sure if we want to mention yet which they are. But we do know that there are going to be other companies that can produce open LMI soon. Cool. Um, so the next big thing that we're trying to start with is these LMI scripts, and so that hence why I'm trying to throw together a hack test this afternoon to see if we can get uh, a couple of uh, a couple of ideas out there and throw them together. They're actually pretty easy to build. Um, I built a, I built a uh, an example one, a, te a test one, a hello world one, effectively um, in about an hour after yesterday. So it's. It's pretty. It, we need to do a little bit more um, in documenting how to how to put these together, but I think that that might be something we get out of the hack test. But I'm, I'm diverging from my talk, so I should probably get back onto it. So let's let, let me talk a little bit right now about what our limitations are, what we haven't managed to finish yet. Uh, we, we do have a lot of coverage. We have some we have some uh, issues right now with uh, storage use cases that aren't necessarily interesting to an installer because our storage library came out of Anaconda. So it's really good for creating a file system. It's not so great for extending one right now. That's an interface that they're working on with us, uh, but it's not there yet. Um, we don't have an interface to talk about snapshots because, well, who, who makes snapshots during an install? During the install, one could argue that they should, but it, it, it's not. It, it's not there. Um, with uh, you know, it, with the tools we have available right now, uh, we can't interact with, with we, we cannot set up network storage through OpenLMI yet. We are actively working on a couple of uh, ways to do, to do this, but uh, the next steps we have on here are we need to add support for create if we do make in, for initiating a scheduled connection and initiating an SCOE. Um, but we don't have that right now because that wasn't uh, because that wasn't offered uh, to us. We can work with anything that we already have a uh, device. Mapped on the drive. Uh, so if you go out and, and call my schedule command, you're free to work with that. With that. Um, the other thing that we're working on with, uh, with the storage vendors is actually uh, building up a proxy serv a service in OpenLMI where we can just we can bounce a request uh, through our API to have them grant us a lock, for example, uh, and connect to it. So these, these are things that are coming hopefully with Fedora 20, possibly 21. When our partners land their, their work. Uh, patch management. This one is this one is difficult because we don't uh, we don't necessarily have the right metadata in all places. And I'm uh, and, and for, the, for those of you on the uh, on the recording, I'm staring at the uh, at the uh, maintainer of the pack, uh, of package management on the very right now. So. Uh, <laughs> Right now, we don't have a way to interrogate a system to say, for example, I, I filed this bug a while ago. Is that is that bug fixed in a package that is on this system? We don't have we don't have that linkage, and that's something we want we both want to have and we want to exp uh, expose in OpenLMI. Um, we think there's a lot of value uh, value to be able to do that, um, and so yes, we are going to work with uh, with, with Jan here to uh, to get that functionality added. 
I know you're a lot of your players. <laughs> It'll always nice to have something more. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to I'd like to give a a little uh, I think it's about two minute long demo um, of the storage provider. Uh, I put this uh, together a while ago. It's not actually using the current uh, incarnation of script modules, but it is uh, it, it is a recording of me talking to a remote system built in MLI and setting up a rate array. So. Calling the MLI shell, which is essentially a, a, a wrapper around Python that just uh, that just does a few default imports, and I connect to the remote server. I check the initial configuration. So we got a couple, we've got three empty drives. We got uh, create a partition table on them. Create a partition, create a partition on each of them, and create a create the RAID set, create a file system, and then interrogate again and see that yes, we do in fact have the XT4 RAID set. On that, you know, okay. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, all of that was was performed over net over network uh, communication with the OpenLMI protocol. So this is this is real working code that I could and then if you want, I can after the talk I can demo I can demo live on the system. Um, the other demo that I have here that I'm going to about to start is I've got a demo that just showing how we are we're interacting with. Open LMI remotely to talk to System B to get uh, system service information. So, we okay. connect to that same server. We ask it, I want to see what the uh, services that are start, configured to start a boot and what is, what is their current status. And uh, for the purpose of the demo, I slowed down the output. Extraordinarily fast. It's a lot harder for me to the flash the past two. Um, and then restart, uh, restart our service remotely. And again, all happening on this will do it. <laughs> and it is all happening uh, remotely over the, over the network. Um, there, there was no direct uh, direct shell access required to uh, Um, okay. Can you show the script? Uh, yes. I, okay. um, I, I have a limited time here. Let's see. Have 16 minutes remaining. Oh. <coughs> Wait, how many? 16. Oh, 16. This is uh, 6 0. Yeah. Um, I am running a hack fest immediately after the uh, immediately after lunch in the same room. Uh, so if you want to see uh, some of some of the code, that would be the best place. So I, I would like to have people in uh, and you know try hacking on some of these modules. But uh, the demos that I wrote uh, for this particular example are here. They uh, they are uh, based on uh, older code. They we did not decide that we, we revamped how we were going to do the script modules to make them easier to implement and easier to reuse. So. What I have here is basically it basically amounts to just raw Python talking to the interfaces, but we're, we're trying to do some things more simple. Uh, we're trying to produce these more simple modules as well. So how can you help? What are we What are we looking for out of the, from the community? What do we want to get people in on? Help. Um, help us plan the API. What are, help us focus on what what we what you really think are the, the set of interfaces we need to have right now. We're not, we're not going to cover the tone of, uh, of, uh, in, of a, a APIs in the first pass, or, or even the second pass. We need to know what are the most important things that you would like to be able to manage remotely. And we, uh, and we want to hear from you. We, uh, we also want, uh, if you're building a subsystem, we want a public API for it. We don't, we don't necessarily want it to be OpenLMI. We want it to be QBus. We want it to be, uh, you know, if it's, if it's Easier to do as a simple simple library, make a simple library. Uh, one thing I didn't cover earlier is that we're not trying with OpenLMI to do any of the actual business logic of the, of the work that's doing. We're very firmly making this a compatibility layer that talks to existing APIs and or 
they don't exist, out of helping those subsystems create those APIs so that we can use them. Because they know their, they know their code much better than we ever could. We could very easily re-implement a, a storage library, well, not very easily. We could, we could re-implement a storage library in OpenLMI, but that's not useful to, to anyone. It would be. One, of the product, one of the pushes in this project is to encourage people to build those APIs that we can consume and that others can consume. So if you're working on a subsystem, I know most of you people in this room are, please make sure that you have a public and documented API if you want to do it. Um, the other thing is uh, we're looking, especially in today's Hackfest, to have people help us contribute these uh, LMI modules. And we used to call them scriptums, but uh, I was supposed to change the slide because the Google listed that we're not supposed to use that term. For no reason they didn't share with us. Apparently, uh, it may be somebody's trademark. So we can't come up with another name, and we end up with the less fun sounding uh, LMI, LMI modules or LMI Python modules. But So like I said, uh, and again, this I think is a bit of an older slide. But, uh, our first, our 1.0 release is in Fedora 19. It is testable. It works. I have demo, I, I, I have demoed it. I can do, I don't know if I can do live demos here. Try it. See what you like. See what you hate. T uh, tell us, it doesn't make sense that you did it this way. Tell us you need to do more of that. And just really help us uh, help us turn this into something that people want to use. So with that, I will take questions. So how do you, so I work on Puppet, so how do you kind of envision um, the LMI world living with Puppet world? Because we do have ultimately a lot of overlap, right? Where you're going for less stateful stuff and we're going for complete state management. Right. So I think there's obviously work that we can do to build Puppet stuff and yeah. LMI kind of integration, and I want to hear. That you is the most popular that. question I get. Okay. Um, we're trying to position them so that they can coexist, and ultimately that we want uh, we want puppet uh, factors to to want to use open LMI to do some of their work mm -hmm. to get to that point. Um, puppet, it, it, from from my perspective, and please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's it's uh, it's stock and trade is I want my system to be in this state exactly, yeah. and OpenLMI's target is really change management. It's I need to make an I need to make a modification to something, and so we're uh, I, right now. I envision us working fairly well in parallel because there are, there are things that there there are some things that Puppet uh, does extraordinarily well that we do poorly, uh, such as you know just making sure a, a config file is exactly the, exactly what it should be on the system. Yeah. And there's some things that we that we do well. Uh, like like being able to uh, to monitor and and restart and and, uh, keep, and keep tab life cycle tabs on a service a system service. Mm -hmm. So I, while I do believe that, that yes there are points at which there is overlap, I think that uh, we can uh, that we do have each our own specialities. And I would like to I would like for the project the two projects to be working together to uh, to reduce the amount of individual work we we each need to do to accomplish our stuff. I mean if you know, if uh, OpenLMI is good at, set, at setting up storage, it might, it's perhaps in public's best interest to just call the, open, the local OpenLMI interface rather than to, re, re, rather than to uh, be calling out, to forking out the local, product, the local uh, commands. Agreed. Well, so one of the things that you guys have, and I've been playing with this for a while, so one of the things that OpenLMI has that Puppet doesn't have is um, we're really bad at running one time things because it's just never been. So, yeah, as you said, it's all about managing. Complete state, right? So right. you want the files are like this, service is like this, and it's not good at setting things up to get into that state. So like, we should talk more about how we can build stuff that is stateful but uses open on and really complex stuff. Because yes, yeah, stuff like setting up, and I know you guys aren't even there yet with this, but like stuff like setting up scuzzy mounts and crap, we're really bad at doing. So. Yeah, we are. We're working on that quite a lot, or whatever. As part of the um, as part of the Blue project and part of the Blue storage management project, uh, we're working with those, with those groups to get that done right, and then we're going to provide the public interface, uh, the, the public external interface for that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, other questions? Yeah, that usually is a big one. Yeah. Let me just from from the perspective of. Um, so, um, I'm 
I'm not sure what, what's, what's the current state of from this perspective. I mean, when I'm a citizen and I want to manage, I don't know, maybe hundreds of machines or you know, different processes. Uh, what are my options? Like, when it comes to OpenLMI, can I use it somehow simply? Or do I have to like uh, write my own scripts and everything? Well, that, uh, well first, uh, first off, uh, as part of that same time, as we started building the API application a couple years ago, what we did find was that, you know, the common wisdom is you know, everybody wants it to be able to do these things. Uh, and what we found was that uh, most of the admins that we spoke to never ever started up the GUI. They always they did all of their work with uh, PowerShell scripts, or uh, or in the case of the managing Linux, it was all cut a custom Python or Bash shell. So. We, we, we took a look at that and said, okay, so it makes more sense for us to provide them with a comprehensive and easy to use scripting environment than it does to focus on doing a, a graphical environment right now. A graphical environment is great to showcase at a presentation, but it's not actually all that useful to a, to a real thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for, for me as an admin, I'm, uh, I should be able, right now, I should be able to write my own Python script that should be kind of simple for me, and right now, use them no. on my machines. Right now, no. That's uh, again why I'm having a hack fest this afternoon. Okay. okay. We want to build. We want to build. It, right now, you can write a complicated Python script. Okay. That will not touch <laughs> machines. Yeah. Um, that's the ultimate goal, right? Yes. To, yeah. Yes. And the ultimate goal is to have something that is at least as easy as the Bash script they're uh, they're using today. Yeah. Probably much more so. Anybody else? Dealer? All right, then. Thank you very much for coming.